Hey, I'm Latif Nasser. Today, I'm going to play you an old episode that I reported way back in 2015. It's got science. It's got miracles. It's got Vikings. It's got a potentially hazardous kitchen experiment performed by senior producer Matt Kilty and I. And what I really love about this episode is how it makes you see progress not as a straight line, not, sometimes not even as a line at all. Uh, sometimes it's, it's actually a circle. I swear it'll make sense at the end of the episode. I now present to you Staff Retreat. Yeah, you're, wait, wait, you're listening. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. Yeah. Rewind. Okay, I'm Jad Abumrad. I'm Robert Krulwich. This is Radio Lab, and today... Well, today... Yes. The story of an axe-wielding nun coming through a window to smack some staphylococcus and take you back to the future. <laughs> exactly. The story comes... Does that make any sense? I don't well, know. Well, it will. Okay, it will. it will. The story comes in two parts, both from our producer, Latif Nasser, and here is part one. So, the way the story goes, it starts in 1928. 1928. Alexander Fleming, the story goes, who knows if it's apocryphal or not, is growing staph, staphylococcus, in his lab. That's Maren McKenna. She's a science writer. And staph is a bacterium. It lives on our skin, and it especially likes parts of the body that are warm and damp. So it likes to be just up our noses or... In our genitals or in our armpits, places like that. And generally, it's no big deal. Doesn't really do us any harm. But if it gets into a scratch or a cut and makes its way inside our bodies... Staph goes from being this benign companion to being potentially deadly. Anyway... London, 1928. Fleming is growing staff in his lab. In these little Petri dishes. And he was a slob, basically. <laughs> and he goes on a vacation, leaves his Petri dishes, covered in bacteria, just around, leaves his window open. And something blows across his lab plates. Some tiny little speck of a thing just floats in through the window and comes to a rest on one of those Petri dishes. And so a few weeks later... Fleming, finally, back from vacation. He needs to use those lab plates again, and he and his assistant go to clean them off. I mean, you'd imagine that he would see some real lush, nice, furry <laughs> lawn of staff just overflowing yeah. right out of the plate. Because it's been sitting there for so long. It's been a staff party. But on one of the plates that they pick up, they realize that it's almost polka dot. It's got little dead zones all over it. Little patches uh, where the staff is dead. Dead, dead patches. Zone. So something blew through the window, landed in the dish, and starts killing the bacteria. Yeah, and so when Fleming looks down at his plate, he sees that at the center of these, you know, staff dead zones, uh, there's a tiny speck of natural mold. Ooh. Of mold. And they realize that that mold is expressing a compound that is killing the staff around it. It's like emanating rays of death. What was the compound? That compound was called... Penicillin. The first true antibiotic. Infectious diseases that had been killing people for as long as we had been people suddenly could be stopped. And it just blew in through the window? That is the, that is the story that's always been told. However it got there, it, it, was, it was amazing. It was a miracle. It was called a miracle drug, right? I mean, it was just, it, was, it really was a moment when the world changed. When Fleming was put on the cover of Time magazine. This was 1944, height of World War II. It was a picture of his face and the, the banner on the cover said, his penicillin will save more lives than war can spend. But, and this is, um, I had no idea about this, virtually at the exact same time when Fleming's face is on the cover of Time magazine, like two months later, um, this Stanford researcher publishes that he has found five different strains of staph that do not respond to penicillin. Really? Yeah. This is happening while he's on the cover? Virtually the exact same moment. And it's the first sign that staph 
has responded to the penicillin in the world by developing resistance. It's almost like a uh, set producer, Soren Wheeler. The era of penicillin was over before it began. Almost before it began. Before it's even released to the general public. Wow. And that penicillin-resistant staff moves across the globe. And in 1957, in Cleveland, some scientists gather together. And they are in a panic. They have no idea why they've lost the antibiotic miracle so quickly. So scientists across the globe put their brains together and try to come up with a new drug. The next amazing thing. And in 1960, they get it. Methicillin. And it works. For about 11 months. 11 months? And so we started this arms race. There was a bug, and then there was a drug that took care of it, and then there was a better bug. Drug, bug, drug, bug. Right, exactly. I actually found this list. Uh, Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so streptomycin, 1943, resistance, 1948. Methicillin, 1960, resistance, 1961. Clindamycin, 1969, resistance, 1970. You can think of it as leapfrog, or you can think of it as a game of whack-a-mole. Ampicillin, 1961, then 1973. So that's a little... Carbenicillin, released 1964, resistance 1974. They're getting better. They're getting better. There were always more drugs. You know, the drug development was doing really well for a really long time. Hyperacillin, introduced 1980, resistance 1981. But after the year 2000, drug companies begin to realize it's not really in their best interest to make antibiotics anymore. And the end I have on this list is uh, linizolid, which is introduced 2000, resistance 2002. Wow. And there are a few more, but you get the idea. Antibiotic approvals, the, the entry of new drugs to the market, just kind of fell off a cliff. Why? Well, to, it takes 10 years and a billion dollars to get to the point where the drug is marketable. But as soon as you get the drug on the market... The resistance clock is running. So you probably won't make your money back. And as you've probably heard, we now have these situations. A well, frightening new warning from the Centers for Disease Control about the spread of a string of germs. Where literally nothing works. So-called superbugs are now turning up in hospitals. In and the patient states. dies. The there are now bugs that can resist all of our drugs. I have seen physicians break down weeping over this. It's not the, the way that medicine is supposed to fail anymore, but it does. I mean... I, I know that, that possibly the, the origin story of penicillin is, is apocryphal, so this is all a little suspect, but, you know, just to enjoy imaginings for a moment, like, it just seems like if that happened, well, let's just open up a bunch more windows. Just something ought to blow in. Yeah. But we could wait a long time, right? I mean, we had, staff had been around right. for millennia before 1928. Yeah. But, you know, the whole reason that I wanted to do this story is because... Kind of, there is a new window. It's a different kind of window, though. Not it's, not a window next to some petri dishes. Not a window next to some petri dishes. Kind of a window next to some petri dishes, but a totally different kind of window. What kind of window is it? Well, I'm about to tell you that. Is something blow into the window? Yeah, but it's not mold. It's way more fun than mold. It 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 carries an axe. How about that? So it's a person, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what I'm, I don't even know what I'm referring to anymore. <laughs> Uh, part two? Yeah. Okay, hey, I'm Jad Abumrad. I'm Robert Krolwich. This is Radio Lab. We're ready now for part two. Now, remember when part one ended, there was a window open and something was going to come through. We don't know what. But we know it's not mold. Yeah, we know it's not mold. So whatever it is, whatever it was, whatever it will be, we will hear about it now from our reporter, Lot of Nasser. Well, actually, there is this story about these two women who did open a window... Uh, to to an alien and distant land. Um, and actually, in a way, it's a story about reimagining the past. but to me, it's a it's a it's a it's a story about a friendship. Hey, everybody. Hello again. Hello Hi. again. It's a story about an unlikely friendship. Um, <laughs> it's a buddy it's, film. It's a buddy. Yeah, it's a buddy movie. <laughs> okay, so yeah, tell yeah, maybe just walk us through it. So. Right. So okay, so you have. Um, Hello, I'm Dr. Christina Lee. Christina. And I'm an associate professor in Viking studies at the School of English at the University of Nottingham. She's a historian. And then you also have... Hi, I'm Freya Harrison. Freya. I'm a research fellow in the Centre for Biomolecular Sciences at the University of Nottingham. And Freya, Freya's a microbiologist. She studies bacteria. 
We'll start with her. Okay. So most of my work is is about sort of looking at how bacteria evolve during very, very long-lived infections. But <laughs> my, my big hobby is, is Anglo-Saxon Viking reenactment. So I had purely sort of amateur interest in, in the history and uh, mainly in uh, dressing up as a warrior and uh, going to Fight Club every Wednesday night and learning to use the weapons. Really? <laughs> yeah. So this is actually not Freya's group. This is a group in New Jersey, but basically they do the same thing. Hundreds of people go out into, you know, some field with some dulled weapons. Everything from swords, spears, axes and... And we give each other a, a jolly good bashing and have a good time. <laughs> I only mention this because it it actually plays into the story. Well, it was it was really a nice sort of coincidence, really. So I, I 2012, a uh, few years after finishing her doctorate, Freya goes off to work at the University of Nottingham. Nottingham's one of the places in the UK, not only for, for microbiology, but for sort of Anglo-Saxon and Viking history. And she goes there to study microbes, but she figures, hey, why not, while I'm here, brush up on my old English? With her, it's um, Wulfir, it's um, Abudissa. I'd studied some old English to a, a level where I could sort of read and and speak a little bit. Let's stand on nich nichter. But she figured, hey, she could she could be better, and if she did, she she would get deeper into the whole reenactment thing. So I rather cheekily emailed the School of English's Old English Reading Group. That's where she met Christina. Yeah. The historian. At one point, uh, Christina, the historian, asks Freya, like, what do you do? And Freya said, you know, uh, my day job is that I'm a microbiologist, but on evenings and weekends, I'm a history nerd. And Christina said the moment she heard that. I just kind of thought, I've, I've found my kindred spirit here. Because she was like, wow, I'm like your mirror image because I'm a historian by day, but by night I'm a microbiology nerd. I've been interested in um, infectious disease for quite a long time, which um, I, don't, I don't find any kind of friends in my department. She told me she's the kind of person who would, you know, watch Ebola coverage on the news and not be able to stop watching. So... Eventually, they start talking about historical diseases. So, like, how would people back then have treated something like, you know, Ebola? Freya is especially interested in this because she, for her historical reenactment, is developing this nun character who goes off and heals people. But anyway, so they're talking back and forth, and then to cut a long story short, they they find themselves both interested in this one particular book. It's known as Bald's Leech Book. So this is about 1,100 years old. What's it called? Ball, balls what? Balls leech book. It's balls. nothing to do with no hair. Oh. <laughs> Even though it's it just spelled. Ball, is it B-A-L-D? It oh. is indeed. And leech, like leech, like a like a leech, like a little worm that grabs onto your and sucks your blood? <laughs> no. No, it comes from the old English word leche, which is actually a healer or a doctor. So the, the, the little squiggly animals are called leeches because they're medicinal not the other way around. <laughs> oh. So the doctor wasn't named for the leech. The leech was named for the doctor. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and Bald is the is a man, the guy who wrote we the book? We think it's a guy. We think it's a guy's name. And what is this book? So it's kind of like this old healer's handbook. It's filled with these potions and cures. The original manuscript is in the British Library. Locked away. But... 21st century, very kind people have digitized the original old English text and, and put it online. So Christina and Freya bring it up. And they start going through all the remedies. And, you know, it, it describes to you remedies for stuff that is a little bit different. You know, things like... Thone deovo, thone manon. Uh, possession by the devil. Which, according to this leech book, the remedy for someone who is possessed by the devil is you... Spew a drink, a lutre. Make this kind of like foul brew. You make them drink it, and it'll make them vomit out the devil. And and then there's another remedy for warts. Bisheop wirt. And uh, all I'm going to say about that one is that it involves hound's urine and mouse blood. And then things like... How should we say, make your husband more physically attentive <laughs> or less physically attentive, whichever you, uh, whichever direction you need to moderate it. Pig's blood, I hope, or toad blood. Drink on neacht nestia. Actually, it's just you boil a plant in some water and give it to the guy. Oh. Yeah. Anyway. So Frey and Christina are going through this leech book, looking for some kind of wound. Something that was clearly an infection. Some pussy 
uh, something. something. We could clearly say that's that's bacterial. And eventually they, they find an entry. Where at the end of the recipe, it says in Old English. Say betsta lachadon. Say betsta lachadon. The best medicine. The best medicine. Hmm. Yeah, move over laughter. Yeah. And we thought, how can we not try this one? What was the best medicine for? So it said it was for a lump in the eye. It's actually called when in Old English. Yeah. <laughs> These days, if you get a, of course, that, that could be something like a wart, right? Mm. But there is a suggestion by archaeologists that eye infection was, was rife amongst the Anglo-Saxons because really? you lived in buildings where you, you had smoke going on, you lived cramped together. So it could also be a sty. What is a sty? It, it's an infection of an eyelash follicle. You rub it and it itches and then it gets yeah, swollen. Yeah, and it causes quite a nasty red lump. It's a sty in your eye. Sty in your eye. Now, it just so happens that the bacteria that causes the sty in your eye is... Staphylococcus aureus. Staph. Oh, the same stuff as the Mr. Window Man, Penicillin Man. Exactly. And we just thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a bit of spare time and earn a couple of hundred quid to buy the ingredients and just give this a go? Yes, let's give it a try. You know, why, why the hell not? And matter of fact... Look at this place! We thought that too. Studio. Not bad. Recently, all. producer Matt Kielty and I went to my tiny apartment in the city and all right. we tried to cook it up too. Are you ready to cook? Oh, I'm ready to cook. <laughs> I've, I've got this recipe here oh, if awesome. you'd like yeah, it. Yeah, 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 please read it. Go for it. Okay, it goes like this. We're I with that's the first line of the recipe, and right off the bat, for Christine and Freya, there's a problem. That first ingredient... The word kropliach. 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 Christina said it was quite difficult to translate. Nobody quite knows, you know, what it is. But luckily... Just a couple words over was a clue. Then garlic. The second ingredient. Garlic, which um, is an allium species, and kropliach. We know this was another allium. That's what the Dictionary of Old English um, tells us. So they figured probably what they were dealing with was an onion or a leek. But we didn't know which one. So we thought, OK, we'll try one that has onion and one that has leek. Now, the recipe doesn't call for this, but we did it anyway. Um, peel the onion. Chop it up. <laughs> the same for the garlic. And the recipe, it doesn't tell you how much. <laughs> it just tells you equal amounts of. Uh, so you take out the measuring cups, you measure out equal amounts. Yeah, equal amounts into the pestle. And then after that, okay, it says... A canoe well to somne. Pounded well together. Okay. But you have to be really pounded. And, and pounded Freya did. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, Lots of lots of time with a mortar and pestle. Um, muscles built up from uh, wielding a sword for pounding the ingredients. Look, it's starting to be more of a mush. Third ingredient. The next one was definitely something you wouldn't have knocking around in your kitchen. And fares yeal and bea em fella. Ox gall. Ox gall. Bovine bile from a from a cow's gallbladder. <laughs> what do you do? Have to kill the cow and then go reach no, it? No, it's actually a, a very standard ingredient in microbiology labs. Ox bile. Today in 2015, you can but should not just buy it on the internet. Here we go, here we go. And so you take the ox bile, add it to the onion and garlic. And then the fourth ingredient. Ye neem ween. Wine. And it's wine time. Red wine, white wine, what, like what well, kind of wine are we talking about here? This is the thing. So we, we had quite a discussion about what type of wine should we use. And we don't know really, did they have red wine? Did they have white wine? What was the alcohol content? But I did a bit of, bit of detective work. And she figured out that the monastery where this leech book was written, well, they, she figured out where their vineyard was. Was. And just down the road, there's this modern organic vineyard. So they used that wine. Cavicchioli. and figli. And figli. I just want to point out how difficult it is to find English wine. We had to use Italian, but... Once you get all that stuff together, you're onto the final ingredient. The, the fifth ingredient was actually that you're specifically told that you have to mix these ingredients together in a brass or a bronze pot. Um, I don't have one. <laughs> um, so we had to sort of add pieces of, you know, of copper that would have been available to people at the time. So they had to do some research, but they figured out that the copper of today that is most like the copper of a millennium ago was actually cartridge brass, which is what's used as standard in plumbing fittings. Dropped a few pennies in there. We actually use pennies. Do I stir it? I think I stir it. It's like a world's worst cooking show. Um, <laughs> it, it looks and smells like quite a nice, uh, quite a nice summer soup. <laughs> oh. Oh, that looks awful. Oh, that's so gross. Clearly, we 
botched this whole thing. Let us stand the neon nicked on them, our father. And uh, finally... All right, so we're going to cover it. Okay, we're covering it. The directions say we have to let the whole thing sit for a while. It has to be stored for nine days and nights. Okay. okay. That's it. One day goes by, two days, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Nine days later. Uh, all right, here we go. You ready? Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. And on them are fata, are ring through cloth. Then you have to strain it through a cloth. The liquid that comes off, you apply to the person's eye. Oh, the liquid. And um nicked do mid feather. With a feather. With a feather. feather. Say betsta la chadon. Now, clearly, we didn't have any staff to try this out on, but Freya, in her lab, she made these mock wounds with these little plugs of of, of collagen. So it's a bit like jelly. Basically, it's like a like a goopy substance made to be kind of like a flesh wound. And we infect these wounds with bacteria with the staff. Then they put this thousand-year-old recipe that had been standing there for nine days, they put it on the bacteria that was in the fake wound. We'd obviously, we're, we, we didn't think this was going to work. No. We thought, you know, well, given the ingredients, we might see some small killing effect on the bacteria, but it won't be anything to write home about. They thought maybe it'd kill 10%, 20% of the bacteria. But then when they came back the next day... It was a staff massacre. It went on a rampage. It went on a staff rampage. It was killing, you know, 99.99999% of of these bacterial cells. What? Yeah. At first we thought we'd made some sort of mistake and this was some kind of fluke. You know, we'd, we'd accidentally mixed up our plates or mislabeled something. So... They run the entire experiment again. They grab the ingredients, mash them up, put them on some bacteria, and it happens again. Just absolutely wiped out the bacteria in Killed these, them these dead. wounds. Then they tried a third time and a fourth and a fifth, and it works every time. And this is this this is just something you you really don't see in your career as a microbiologist. <laughs> and eventually, they escalated from just regular staff to to MRSA, to the methicillin resistant staff. And this is one of the bad ones. The superbug. New government data estimate that about 2,000 people are dying of community-based MRSA every year. This one is is very dangerous. So Christina and Freya, they sent some of Bald's brew to one of their collaborators in the States. Our collaborator, Kendra Rumbau in in Lubbock in Texas. Kendra took the stuff, put it on some MRSA bacteria, and then a week later sent Frey and Christina an email. And I think it was actually a three-word response. I, th- I think she just simply said, What the fuck? What the f***? <laughs> <laughs> Bald's best medicine had just wreaked havoc on the MRSA. It killed 90% of them. This is it's beyond our wildest dreams. Now, uh, Frey and Christina made very clear that this is not yet a miracle drug. I mean, it's not even being tested in humans. So absolutely... Do not do this at home. They don't even know if this is safe. It might be that if you don't do it in exactly the way we did, nasty fungus could grow in it, give you a worse infection. So, uh... We should not have done this. (laughs) Matt and I, we... (laughs) Dumped ours down the drain. But the thing about this whole story that is so intriguing and so cool to me is this time travel thing, which is so strange. Like, it's like the idea that something a thousand years ago, uh, like a bullet forged a thousand years ago, we could, we could use it now and then it could work. That, that, the time travel dimension of that is so weird to me. It kind of makes you think differently about I don't know. Progress. So, uh, without much further ado, Dr. Christina Lee and uh, Dr. Freya Harrison, and they're going to talk to us about some ancient biotics. For example, just a few weeks ago, uh, Freya and Christina got up in front of the Royal Society of Chemists. Thank you very much, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here. Large hotel conference room, 100 or so people. Uh, Freya actually uh, got up on stage dressed as a nun. Okay, so this is one interpretation of what an Anglo-Saxon scientist may have looked like. And they presented the results. Next ingredient. 
is particularly they did the cooking demo. And then at some point, Christina said something really interesting. She was like, okay, sure, we want to write this off because it has demons and dragons and elves in it. But are we sure that we know what they meant by those words? Like, for example. There are remedies which ask you, sing for Ave Maria's. And we would say, oh, that's so superstitious. This is all in their heads. But there again, we should also remember, this is a period when people do not have watches. You do not have your nurse, you know, so that's got the watch. Everybody knows the Ave Maria. Everybody knows the length of an Ave Maria. So maybe it's maybe it's take this medicine and wait 20 minutes. Uh, and I know how to standardize 20 minutes, which is... Three Ave Marias, four Ave Marias. May uh, so so it, well, that's fascinating. It may appear one way and it's it in fact could be a, a totally different way it suggests that the in order to time travel you have to somehow god it's like we don't even have the, the language to be able to understand what they were doing it, the, there's how a effective f- it there's a phrase the the past is a foreign country we need to learn the language of the doctors of that time we need to kind of be a little bit less mm-hmm. um dismissive and learn a little bit more, you know, stuff from them. I learned a bit of humility this way. But here's the reason why this is so confusing to me. Mm. So 1,100 years is a crazy long time for humans. Mm. And for bacteria, that's like an exponentially crazy long time. Yeah. So how is it that something that this man bald was doing to these bacteria then like like it's not even the same bacteria yeah how could that even work that that's a that's an awesome question so so one thing we've got to think about is well why did these medicines drop out of use and maybe it's because when they were used the bacteria evolved resistance but now a thousand years later when these medicines have not been used you would expect that resistance to be lost this is something that Marin McKenna mentioned to Soren and I, that sometimes when you take a drug out of circulation... Sometimes resistance will decline. That doesn't always work, but sometimes resistance does decline. So if we had been using this compound through the ensuing thousand years, then maybe it wouldn't work. So there's an interesting discovery there, like that what worked once and then was resisted, you give it a rest and it can work again and it will be resisted, and you put it to rest, and if you had enough different, if you could go to different places and the different paths, to to go to China, where they now got all these people studying Chinese cures and Arab cures, you could come up with a a rich historical cocktail of armamentariums that will work if you bring them in, take them out, bring them in, take them out, and the whole world, the whole world of the past then becomes the fruit of your future, sort of. So it's also possible, like now I have a, suddenly an image that it's possible that... that this is Soren Wheeler, by the way, in conversation with Marion McKenna and Latif. That, that a thousand years ago, these folks went through what we went through with penicillin in that they this guy wrote something in the book and it's actually called The Best Medicine. He probably got on the cover of whatever their version of time was. He got their Nobel Prize. And everybody <laughs> celebrated. And then years later, styes were coming back and the garlic wine didn't work anymore and they stopped using it and it got put away and then here we are and we discover it and it's been put away long enough that like then, then now I'm thinking about future some future civilization digs up an old medical textbook that was in some dusty whatever and discovers penicillin and it works did we did I lose you on that Mary? no no I'm still with you I'm just I don't know how, it just seemed like it seemed like such a great hypothetical construction I just didn't really know what I could add to it <laughs> Sorry, I took over. Thank you for listening. It's actually, it's been almost a full decade since we aired this episode. And since then, Christina and Freya have published several papers to show how this concoction works and why. Apparently, there's not just one, but multiple key ingredients at work in their ancient salve. They've also been collaborating with PhD students to create a recipe that can be turned into an actual medicine available to folks like you and me. But science is a slow process, uh, and things like logistics and funding just make it even slower. They are pretty hopeful that they will get something to us before the next 
1,000 years pass by. Producer Lots of Nasser, with help from Soren Wheeler, and uh, produced by Matthew Kielty. Special thanks this hour to Steve Diggle. And to Alexandra Ryder and Justin Park, who came down from Yale to be our old English readers. To Gene Murrow from the Gotham Early Music Scene. And to Marsha Young on the Medieval Harp. Carl Monroe of Tadcaster. And the rest of the Barony of Iron Bog. Not totally sure what that is, but I know they helped us out. And I guess we should help ourselves out. Yes, of the door. very quickly. <laughs> or through the window. I'm Jed Abumrad. I'm Robert Krulwich. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alana, and I'm from Queens, New York. Radiolab was created by Jad Abumrad and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Akadi Foster Keys, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindhu Nyanus Sambandam, Matt Kielty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Sarah Kari, Sarah Sandback, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly, Emily Krieger, and Natalie Middleton. Hi, this is Ellie from Cleveland, Ohio. Leadership support for Radiolab science programming is provided by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative, and the John Templeton Foundation. Foundational support for Radio Lab was provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation.